Go ahead and introduce Brian and just talk about some of the accomplishments he had on and off the football field. Brian Westbrook, a Walter Payton Award winner, was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles in 2002. He then went on to become a two-time Pro Bowler in 2015 and 2018, respectively. He was inducted into the Philadelphia Eagles Hall of Fame and the Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame. He is currently a broadcaster on DirecTV's Fantasy Zone, radio host on 97.5 The Fanatic, and 76 Capital Athlete Venture Group member. As an athlete venture group member, Westbrook handles hands-on the company's current sports tech fund and enables athletes to work with exciting startups in esports, sports betting, data collection, data analytics, media, and more. You guys are up. This is gonna be a great fireside chat. Chad and Brian. <laughs> Cool, well, uh, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, quickly, I know it's been said a lot today, um, but huge, huge congrats and, and thanks to Maeve, Will, and the entire team. It takes a big team to make something like this happen, to put it together. It never runs smoothly, and you guys did an incredible job. And everyone, should one more hand for the team here at, at Penn State. <clears throat> and then for our good friend Alex, wherever, Alex Scheinman, um, thank you. Uh, Proud to call you a friend, and um, congratulations, and can't wait to, to see what, what next year's uh, going to bring. Uh, quick, uh, quick thing to the students, I've been fortunate to get to work in sports pretty much my entire career, and I can say there's never been a better time for the opportunity to work in sports. I mean, just the idea of esports being a thing, I mean, esports needs accountants and marketers and sales, just like all kind of traditional opportunities. Our portfolio company that we're investors in, Nerd Street Gamers out of Philadelphia, NSG.GG, they're hiring. So like, this is really awesome. I'm really excited for everyone. Um, and now, Mr. Westbrook. <laughs> so uh, we have the all-time, all-purpose yards leader in the NCAA right here. Um, been a pretty, uh, pretty powerful stage today with the running backs on this stage. I'm pretty biased, but I would say two of the best running backs in the last 20 years of football right here, right now. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can you guys hear me? Good. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's certainly, this is my first time on campus here. Obviously, it's a beautiful campus. It's great to see um, so many eager people that are willing to learn, wanting to learn more about what's going on, especially in the business world. And as you apply what you guys have learned over the last four or five, 10 years here to the real world, it's important. Um, thanks so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. And one, one quick, uh, if you're not already, at 36 Westbrook, great follow. Make sure <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, but Brian's a lot of fun. Um, the one thing I said, as successful as Brian was on the field as a player, He's an incredible person and very lucky and fortunate to get to work with you. Appreciate and, that. And uh, awesome, awesome stuff. So we're going to have so a lot of fun. Before Go we start, so oh, you guys had Go. Saquon here earlier. So, I mean, you got to show me up a little bit. I want to, I had to be before <laughs> Saquon. Saquon, I was able to meet him at the NFL Combine last year. And, you know, obviously he was the best player in the draft last year. And, and I always laugh. I tell people this story. We're sitting in our first meeting, so they're introducing me. Um, I see my, myself and Fred Taylor as the mentors of the guys that are going to be going through the combine, the running backs. And so, you know, we were saying, listen, just go out there, do your best, do everything you can. And so Saquon kind of raises his hand shyly and says, well, you know, how do we make a first impression on the coaches? And so everyone starts laughing because you're the, the best player in the draft. You've already made your, your first impression. And so it, it was just kind of, I still laugh about that now after you know, over 2,000 yards combined, being one of the best rookies in the NFL this year. It's impressive to have a guy like that still coming back and understanding his roots here at Penn State. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah, really, really awesome, yeah. really powerful. Good man. Um, so we're gonna talk, we'll talk a little about your upbringing, obviously Villanova, yeah. the Eagles, and then obviously we're gonna get into the business side of things and mix it in, but, so I grew up in Maryland, went to DeMatha, which is a powerhouse for anyone that doesn't know it, they had Danny Ferry, Victor Oladipo, Bogans, Paul Rabel for lacrosse fans. Yep. 
and, and of course, be West. So what was kind of your upbringing and school and what were you like as a kid? Well, you know, as a kid, a young kid, I was very athletic and, you know, you can't make it into the NFL unless you're, you have to be extremely athletic, you have to be lucky, you have to be healthy. And so as a young kid, I was very athletic, uh, one of the better kids in boys and girls clubs. So, you know, at a young age, up until high school, I was really, really good. And then my first year of high school, this is one of my stories, my first year of high school, I went out for football. Um, the first practice, I went out for varsity team, the first practice, um, they, were, they, they ran us to death. I, I told the coach, I said, listen, I have asthma, and I'm, I'm having an asthma attack, right? And so I told him that. He said, oh, go sit down. Don't worry about it. And, and so we, we're going to call, call your parents. I was like, oh, yeah, cool, call them. And so my mom gets there, and the coach is trying to explain to my mom, like, you know, Brian, he got really exhausted in the first, you know, circuit drills, things like that. He had an asthma attack. And so, you know, when your mother gives you that look, like, she was like, first of all, Brian doesn't even have asthma. <laughs> and so, so she was, she was like, yeah, listen. So that was the, my last day on varsity. And I went down to JV. They kicked me down to freshman team in my freshman year of football. You know, I played nine years in the NFL, but my freshman year of high school, I couldn't even get on the field. They wouldn't let me play offense, defense, or special teams. And so my entire freshman year, I played zero plays on football, zero. I wanted to quit, certainly wanted to transfer schools. I didn't see a future for myself um, there at DeMatha after my first year at school. And the coach was just continuously telling me, keep working, get, keep getting better, trust the process, continue to work your craft, be a better student of the game, film, you know, all those types of things, workouts. And eventually, my, my 10th grade year, I was able to play a little bit more. My, my 11th grade year, I grew a little bit. You know, I, I applied all those things, hard work, sacrifice, dedication, in order to be successful. And I was able to you know, be one of the better players in the country my 11th grade year. And so, again, recruited by a lot of different places. And um, finally, my 12th grade year, I get hurt. I tore my ACL. And so back in 1996, when this went down, um, when you tear your ACL, that's, that almost you know, is the end of your career. You're not coming back in six or eight months like guys are coming back now. Um, I, you know, you're usually out a year plus. And so my senior in, in football, where you're making a highlight film of your best plays and you're playing 12 games, I only play five. And so that's kind of what led me to, to Villanova. Um, so after you know, having very, very limited time playing high school football my, my last year, and from where you go from a place where you're getting scholarship offers from Florida State and Oklahoma and Florida and Miami to no school in the country wants to touch you as a player, it was, it was humbling. It got to the point where you, you're questioning, is football for you? It's a physical sport. You know, can you play after tearing the ACL? Um, and luckily enough for me, Villanova came and they offered me a scholarship. Yeah. Um, and as a younger kid, were you interested in business back then? And always curious, what was your first job? <laughs> um, so as a younger kid, my, my dad, just a little background, my mom worked for the government for 40 years. My dad was a bank manager and a um, finance type of guy. So we were always learning finance lessons a along the way and, and you know, allowance, saving money, different things. And we were always, my parents were always challenging me to think about if you were in this situation, what would you do differently? How would you make this business better? How was this customer service uh, good or, or, or could be improved? And so um, we, I was always thinking about business. How can I be better at business? Uh, how could I get involved in the business world, start my own businesses and things like that? And so um, that was always on my mind. Um, now we talk about my first job. This was in, well, my first job technically, I was a coach at basketball camp when I was much, much younger. But the more interesting job was my first job in college. Um, I worked at Blockbuster. You guys, you probably don't know what Blockbuster is. Right? So <laughs> Blockbuster is a place where you used to be able to go and get videotapes. There used to be big videotapes. And you put them in a thing called a VCR. You guys don't know what that is. And so my first day at Blockbuster, I, they hired me. They said, come in. I'm a, I'm a college student. I'm might, maybe a junior year in college. And they hired me. And it's, it's a, really a bunch of high school kids working there. And they said, okay, first day, I'm thinking I'm going to work at the register, you know, check people out and things like that. They were like, okay, this is what you do. You, you take all the movies off the shelves and you wipe the shelves down. And I'm like, okay, when I finish that, when do I get on the register? They were like, no, no, you're going to do that all day long. So the first day at Blockbuster, 
I, um, I just wiped shelves down. And so the, next, the second day I came, I'm like, listen, I'm, a, I'm about to graduate college. These are high school kids that are working the register. There's no way that you're going to have me wiping shelves down again. They were like, oh, no, no, today you're going to wipe the shelves down again. And so that was my second and last day at Blockbuster. <laughs> I, I, I quit. I, I was like, I'm not wiping shelves down all day long at Blockbuster. So I, I brought a book bag and I put all the, a bunch of videos in my bag and stole maybe 20 videos. So that was, that was that's why Blockbuster is out of business. So <laughs> <laughs> not Netflix. Yeah, You're back. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um. So that was kind of my second, that was really my first real job or my first job that I quit. So. Well, nah, it's a good thing you were good at football. Yeah, so. football worked out. That was that. Sure. It was, it was. Um, did you always know you were going to play in the NFL? Was it always something that growing up was or did it kind of You know, so, so, so growing up, I mean, I lived a, an average childhood. You know, we did the same things that everyone does. You play sports with your friends. Um, your family comes over. You, you throw around the football in the backyard. You play board games and things like that. And then, um, so the NFL wasn't never, it was never really my goal. My goal was to, to be able to go out there and live a successful life. And for me at the time, success was, you know, you make 50, 60,000 bucks a year. You know, hopefully your wife brings in 50, 60,000 bucks and you live a nice lifestyle. You have a family and you raise them. And over time, as my skill level football wise continue to get better, I, you know, you start to change your aspirations. You change your goals and your dreams. And you adjust it over time. You know, when I, my junior year in high school, I was getting recruited by everybody. I'm, I, I was sure fire uh, in my mind. I thought I was going to be the, the next great running back. Then you get hurt your senior year, and then you're back to working at the, the bank around the corner. And so you adjust it. And over time, when I go to Villanova, Villanova is not known for a football school. It's just not known for putting out football players into the NFL. It's more known for basketball. And so my, my aspirations there was to get the best education that I possibly could, be able to network with different alumni, and then go find a job, similar to what you guys are doing. I came to a bunch of these conferences just understanding what people thought about business, uh, understanding the things that they've gone through, the, the, you know, the obstacles, the adversity they've faced. How do you respond to when you don't, you, know, you don't get the job that you've been aiming for your entire life? those types of things. And over time, my skill never got better and I was able to play football. But if it wasn't for football, I would be, you know, I was sitting where you guys were at and doing the same types of things, taking the notes, understanding, you know, past performance and hopefully being able to predict, predict the future. Got it. So what, uh, what did you study at Villanova and, and kind of what was your time like there off the field? Yeah. So, so when I was at school, the, the real reason I went to Villanova is because I loved their business program. Um, one of the better business programs in the country, at least on the East Coast, kind of similar to what you guys have here at Penn State, but a little bit better. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, Villanova is a really good place. But I was intrigued by their network with their alumni and what they're able to do um, with their alumni. And so um, I, I was, it was important uh, that a lot of the people that used to go there, they had the connections. And, and as you guys are continuing to learn in this world, in the business world, it's all about the connections. It's all about who you know, you know, the experience and building, nurturing those connections so that when you make a phone call, they'll pick up and say, hey, Brian, I'll be there, or I can help you out. That, that's what it, this world, really, in the sports world and in the business world is all about, nurturing those connections. And so when I went there, I studied management information systems. So it was in a business school, um, really business type of deal, all the stuff that I learned 15 years ago, it's, it's obsolete now, so I don't know anything what's going on in the real world now. But at the same time, it was fun then, I enjoyed it. But you know, if I could stress anything to you guys more than anything, anything that you'll learn is make those connections. Because the person that you're sitting next to, like I sat next to this guy, this guy named was Jason Smith, and I'll never forget him. And he was really, really smart. And we used to share answers on tests. And so, he was really, that was, yeah, that's called, you, you, know, you know, back in the day, yeah, you guys yeah, don't do that yeah, here, yeah, but we used to share yeah, answers on tests. Yeah, they don't need to. Yeah, you, Stay, yeah these guys, you guys are smart, so yeah. we used to share at Villanova. And so, um, the blockbuster in this? Yeah, Come on, yeah, man, yeah I'm man. sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, you guys' thought process of me is going down and down, yeah. 
I tried hard, but um, this guy ends up being a multi-billion, multi-millionaire. He's worth $45 million. And we used to talk every day, but you know, I didn't spend the time nurturing that relationship. And so as soon as, soon as we finished school, I never talked to him again. And then you read in the newspaper 10 years later, this guy is booming in business. And you, you start to think back of all the people that are very successful that you touched throughout your time in school. And because you didn't nurture that relationship, you never saw the interest. And for me, I was more of a, a guy that was kind of shy. I, I never nurtured those relationships. I missed out on a whole bunch. And so now at 39, I'm catching up and playing catch up, uh, trying to go back and find friends on Facebook and LinkedIn and things like that to try to make the business cycle speed up just a bit. And so you guys are young. You're in a perfect position where you're around some of the youngest, brightest minds in the world. This is the place to do it. This is a place to say, okay, you know, you're thinking about that. I'm thinking about this. How can we help each other? Where is that synergy between classmates or even people that, that you work with on different projects? That's what I would be focusing on. That's kind of, if I can go back and do Villanova again, that's something that I would focus on for sure. Cool. So I got, I got one more Villanova question. Happened to live right around there. You, uh, were you a brick bar, Kelly's, <laughs> Onion? What, uh... Do I look like I went to a bar during nah, school? Nah, nah, you were studying. Focused. No, I was, I was not studying. I was... Uh, I um I liked I liked um, the, what was it, Joe's is it Joe's bar or something like that? Maloney's? Maybe 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 one of those bars. Anyone, 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 I spent a lot of time here? there too, so it was it was tough, but it was good. Okay. You guys don't go to bars here, right? No. Yeah, I see a lot of heads shaking. Yes. <laughs> so um so let's talk about let's talk about the Eagles. Yeah. And we got some Eagles fans here. Good. Good. Check them. As they should be. As they should be. Absolutely. Yeah. Only one side. I, I keep of, only one side that of there are Giants fans here as well. Woo! You, should, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> you should be ashamed. Saquon should be ashamed of what they're doing to that they, team. What they? I know. <laughs> yeah. It, it hurts. It hurts. Yeah. Damn, the hot take. So, um, play Villanova, you get drafted mm -hmm. by the Eagles. Like, I know it's people always ask you that, but like, what was that like? I mean, right. the, the hometown team and Coach Reed and. You know, it's weird. So Andy Reid, who was a coach at, Villa, I mean, at the Eagles before I got drafted, he lived right around the corner from Villanova, literally in, within walking distance from Villanova. And so he would sneak over from time to time and watch us practice. He would come to some of our games on Saturday. And so after our season, we do like awards, banquets and things like that. And I would always see him week after week. I would see him. I was getting a lot of awards at the time. And he would always say, you know, if if, if you're available, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to draft you. And he would tell me and my, my head coach, Andy Talley, that as well. And, you know, you, you hear coaches doing that process. You hear coaches say all different types of things. They say, hey, you know, we're going to draft you in the second round. We'll draft you. You're a first rounder. Whenever you're available, we'll pick you up. And so you kind of take it with a grain of salt. And, and for me, I, I didn't know. I didn't know if I was going to get drafted in the third round or fifth round. I ended up getting drafted in the, the third round. I was having a party at my house at the time. Um, and I get a call from Andy. And he's like, you know, this is Andy Reid from Phil the Philadelphia Eagles. We're going to draft you. And I'm shocked. I mean, it's, it's 10 o'clock at night. I've been hanging out with my friends all day long. I'm shocked because Philly, you know, being around the Philadelphia Eagles fans, the fan base, the people that love the team, there's, there's just nothing like it in the world. And for me to be able to go to school in that area for four, for four years and then get drafted to that place, to a team that was already very successful. Donovan was there, Deuce, and a lot of different other guys had kind of paved the way for me. That was special to me. And so, you know, it was a short trip from Villanova right into the city. It was a perfect location for me. That's awesome. So, so early on in your career with the Eagles, who are some of the, the guys you looked up to maybe mentored you and, yeah. and kind of how does mentorship, how is it so valuable throughout your career no matter yeah. what you're doing? Well, well, you're right. You know, finding... This is a hard part about young, a lot of the young guys that are coming into business world. And, and, and don't, don't get this confused. The business world is just like football. It's no different. It's competitive. It's, it's, it's you know, man versus man, woman versus women, man versus woman. It's the best available people are going to get the opportunities. Or if you know the right person, you'll get the opportunity, right? And so in football, it's no different. And so, you know, for me, you know, it's competitive nature. You know, you have to go out there and give your best at, 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 all, at, at, at all the time. Same thing that you guys have to do here. You know, it, it, was, 
it was an adventure. You know, you learn so many different things. Same thing in the football world, you have to find a mentor. You have to find someone that can help bring you along, that has, bring, that has been through this process already. And so for me, that person was Troy Vincent. He was a guy that I looked up to. Um, he was a guy that said, listen, if you spend all your money, you, you know, obviously you're not gonna have any. And if you are continue to spend on the rate that you're spending now, you'll be broke in two years. And other small piece of advice Troy gave me at the beginning of my career. He said, you know, start planning for your next career. What's the next thing you're, you're gonna do? We know that you're gonna do well in football. You know you're gonna work hard. We know that you're gonna do everything you can to be successful in football, but what you're gonna do next? And, and that's maybe where it's a little bit different for you guys. Hopefully you guys get into a career that you can do for the next 50 years, right? Football, sports, you can only do for, you know, the average running back only plays for three years. So just imagine you're 23 years old and the thing that you love, the thing that you wanted to do more than anything, you can't do it anymore. Nobody wants you on the team. And so we're, as a players, we're constantly preparing for the next great thing. We're constantly preparing for the thing that you can do next. In, in you guys' world, in the business world that I'm in now, you're trying to you know, nurture those relationships to continue to build that foundation so that as you build that, that house, that building, it gets stronger and stronger as you go up. And so uh, you know, a big part of that is finding guys that, that can mentor you, finding guys that can go out there and say, here are the pitfalls that I, that I fell in. Here are the things that I did wrong. Don't do this. It'll result in these types of things. And finding that mentor, finding someone that is interested in your future is, is huge. Yeah. Um, so this is crazy, but back kind of when we were graduating, not, uh, I was 03 or 01, oh, two, one, yeah. Yeah. Um, social media, I don't want to say it didn't exist, but it didn't exist. Like Facebook wasn't invented yet, and yeah. LinkedIn maybe got going. It was email. So how was it playing in a pro sport without having to deal with the Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat? Well, it's weird because now you have something to compare it to. And so back then, you're right, Chad, we didn't have Facebook. And I think we might have Twitter towards the end of my playing career. So a lot of the things, you know, we really didn't have phones that had a, a cameras on them back back in the day. And so Thankfully. a lot of things, yeah, thank goodness, <laughs> a lot of things that you were able to do with your friends hanging out, things like that, they were, if you weren't there, you didn't know about them. And now in the football world, the sports world, and in the business world, you have to be so careful. I mean, because something that you slipped up and said when you were having a couple beers at a bar and now you're the CEO of this great big company, those things come back and bite you in the butt. And so now you have to be so smart. You have to be, you know, you have to be a good person, but you have to be smart about the things you do, how you represent yourself. Because at the end of the day, this is one of the things I prided myself in, you know, was my brand. Who, what is your brand? You. I mean, if you go out and everybody thinks you're a knucklehead, ask somebody to invest some money with you. I have some guys that I went to school with that were great guys, but they drank a lot, they partied a lot, and now those are the same guys that are now asking me for money. And in my mind, I'm like, I can't get out the thought that all I know you as is a guy that's at the bar every single week. And so, you know, that, that moving forward part is a hard part for some people, but the social media is, is totally different now. And it can help you in some ways, helping your brand advertise different things social media wise, but it also can be that nail that, you know, you kind of nail the coffin up that can ruin your career. So certainly you want to use it as a, as a building piece, something that can help you, but it also can be that one thing that can really, really hurt you. So make sure that you use it the proper way. Be smart, brand yourself. Whatever you want yourself to represent, put that out on social media. I, I tell my, my, you know, the, the people that work for me, let's put out a highlight film. They don't need to know everything, the good and the bad. Just put out the best things. That's what what's the rep we want to be represented as. And so that's what we do with a lot of our social media stuff. Right. So one step further, what do you think of today's athlete and how they're going about it? And some, in some ways, almost today's athlete, you could argue, is more powerful than the team they're playing for. Yeah. Um, but yet, to your point, like it can get them in trouble so quickly. Yeah. So I, I just think that when, when you talk about today's athlete, you know, back in the day, if I wanted to get a point out, I had to do an interview with a reporter. And then he writes the story in his language, in his words, um, in the paper. And then I kind of read it and say, oh, that's kind of what I said, but not necessarily exactly the same way that I wanted to say it. Now, today's athlete, they have the ability to control the narrative. They have the ability to say, this is what I want to say. I want to say that 
You know, my teammates are the best teammates ever, but I hate this guy. Or I hate all these guys, but I love the coach. You have the ability to control that. You have the ability to market yourself, control your brand. You have the ability to build the narrative that you want. Same thing in business. When you look at some of these businesses, they're building the narrative. They, they're building exactly what they want people to think of them as by, by their social media. And it's brilliant. I've watched one of my good friends build his social media you know, by associating himself with different people, taking pictures. And he was a, he was a wealthy individual, but nobody knew because he just wasn't out there in the public. But now he's built up his social media so well and done such a good job that he's one of the most popular people in the world solely by his social media. Now his social media accounts are catching up with some of his bank accounts and he is a billionaire. He's a guy that's, you know, you know, has made a bunch of money, but social media wise, nobody knew him. Now that his social media has caught up, everybody in the world knows him. Yeah. And so when you were playing um, in Philly, you know, were you getting into business then? Was it a lot of conversation in the locker room? Was it certain guys you were friends with on the team? Like, when did you really start going on that side of things? Yeah, it wasn't really until my second or third year that I actually had money to, be, to, to potentially invest in different things. And so, you know, I talked to a lot of the older guys. What are you guys investing in? How do you build your wealth? How do you retain your wealth? How do you continue to uh, play football and focus on some of the businesses that, um, that they had? And so, you know, I, I talked to them. We talked about mentors before, following up with the mentors, following um, what, they've, what they've done. Um, but it wasn't until my second or third year that I, I got actually into like, you know, investing. Uh, we, we did a lot of the stock market stuff and we were, you know, there's a lot of, you know, ups and downs, ebbs and flows with the stock market. I experienced that. Um, and then we started investing in businesses, things that I love, things that I was interested in. My, it wasn't my first investment, but one of my biggest investments was I bought a horse farm in Maryland. And um, I, I, now, 12 years in, it's not, it was not an investment at all. It was more of a hobby. But we ran it as a business. We were, we were a boarding farm. And so if you guys had a horse um, at your house and you had nowhere to keep it, you, got, you would bring it to us. We would take care of it. You know, we would take you to shows. We would groom it. We would feed it, different things like that. And, and, and you know, then you would just pay us to do that. It's almost like a kennel, but for horses. And we ran that for, for 13, 12, 12 years. And it was very successful. We were full the whole time. But you know, in business, you have to evolve. You have to continue to grow. And now we've kind of phased out of that. But that was my biggest and first investment. Um, probably, in hindsight, 12 years later, it's probably not the best investment that I've made. But it was my biggest investment um, at the time. And you know, I enjoyed it. But financially speaking, it's probably not a great world to be in. Right. And so in today's game, I mean, the, the wearables, the sensors, VR, the data, it's completely taken over mm -hmm. sport. Like, do you think it's good for the game, the players? you wish you would have had some of it yeah. when you were playing? Like, how do you, what's your view on this? Well, it, I think, you know, as the world continues to progress and get better, you need the analytics. We, you know, we're all, this, is, this world is all about how many likes. I mean, how many, how many times have people have retweeted your, retweeted your things? It's about analytics. How unpopular can you become? Um, I like where sports entertainment is heading. I like being able to quantify, you know, these amount of people watched it, 200 million people watched the show because of these characters, these different things. Those things are important to me. Like to me, I'm a very, you know, I, I like to understand why. Why are things happening the, the way that they're happening? And I think analytics uh, give a great basis to why those things are happening. You, you kind of use football as an example. Um, you, one of the key things that a lot of people use for success for football teams is their third down conversion rate. How successful are they at staying on the field, getting the first down on third down? And um, you need those analytics because you need to understand what the defense is doing. 50% of the time, a defense, they're going to blitz on third down. 20%, they're going to drop eight people on third down. And so all these types of things that continue to educate players, to me, that makes it better for the player. It makes it better. You, obviously, you still have to have the athletic ability, but as a player, you're able to think through the game much more uh, than you were able to do when I was playing. Um, the biggest thing, technology piece, that I, that I think I would have enjoyed as a player is you guys see like on the sideline, the quarterbacks come and they have a video now, they have like the tablet. Like when I was playing, we just had still pictures. And so you're kind of guessing at what people are doing and trying to remember to play. 
on, if, if you're on the field now and you can see exactly what the player did when you did this, that, and the other, that's perfect. That, that would help my game a whole lot. That's one of the small technologies that I yeah. think have improved the play from series to series, from quarter to quarter, from game to game for a lot of players. Gotcha. Um, so I'm curious, you know, it's, it's a biased question, but as Sandy was saying earlier, like why? Why 76 Capital? Why'd you want to get involved in our athlete venture group, yeah. chaired by Ryan Howard, um, friend from Philly? And, um, and then what are the investments are excited because we're investing in future of basketball, baseball, right. esports, sports betting? Like, well, when you talk about, I mean, when we talk about the future of sports, when you talk to all these GMs, almost in every sport, they're talking about analytics. You're talking about how we can track um, our players. How can we make sure that we're getting the best out of our players day in and day out? If they're doing something wrong, if their body mechanics aren't right, we can try to fix that. Um, if they're shooting a better percentage from the right side of the floor versus the left, we'll just only put them on the right. You know, if, if he's stronger on his right leg and weaker on his left leg, we need to strengthen that leg, left leg because if you don't, um, he's more susceptible to injury. All these things are like analytics that are getting into sports that are really, really cool. And I think at the end of the day, all these people, they want the best athletes. They want to win. And if you can find a way to help people win in business or in the sports world, you'll make a bunch of money. And so now, you know, I think Vizen is, is pretty cool because Vizen is basically, you know, the analytics. They're, gonna, they're the CNBC of sports betting, right? So now that everyone is sports betting on their apps, their sports betting um, in the casinos live, having people explain some of the bets to you, have people tell you about a game that you wouldn't have any knowledge of. To me, if you're a gambler, that's crucial. Um, and so the, the, having that on 24 seven, that's really, really cool. I think things like Shot Tracker are really cool. And so Shot Tracker basically is, they put a tracker inside of a basketball and they track all the different shots. So if you have 10 guys on the floor, they can track 10 different players putting up 100 shots a piece on different courts. That's really cool technology. In, in the old days, they used to have coaches running around tracking it, like a you know, pencil and paper, just tracking it down. But now you have um, the technology to be able to read exactly where these guys are making shots at, where's the best place, the most optimal place for these competitors. And so now you're getting the best out of your players. And I think all the analytics, when you look across the board, all the technology is all framed so that you get the best out of the players and put them in the best position possible. Yeah, um, and, and we've been so lucky, we've gotten to see you kind of sit down with the entrepreneurs and the founders of these companies. And what's that conversation like? How is that kind of relatable? Not that they're athletes, but some of the char characteristics and traits yeah. of our founders. Well, one of the good things you learn about people is that a lot of these companies are started with a dream. And I have a dream that I want to be the best analytic company in the world. And when you look at successful athletes, you know, like I mentioned before, you have, to, you have to work hard, you have to dedicate yourself, you have to sacrifice, and you have to be disciplined. And the same thing that's going to make you guys successful, successful in the business world are those traits, hard work, dedication, sacrifice, discipline. If you're disciplined and you're hard work and all those things, then you'll be successful at something. And so when you talk to some of these young entrepreneurs, you see the vision, you see the passion, you see what they have envisioned for themselves and as their company and their goals. And it's always refreshing to see that. You also see, you know, some guys trying to do the replicate and duplicate the same things that have happened before and failed before. And so you see some good things, you see some bad things. And with the bad things, you say, OK, let's try a way to e either improve it where I can help you. Or you say, you know what, you know, such and such tried this before. It didn't work. Why don't you try something different or maybe switch it up just a little bit, change it just a little bit so you can be successful. Um, but it, it's, for me, it's certainly refresh, refreshing to see people thinking. And it also gets me, keeps me young, allows me to think a little bit more about different things in business. Um, it, so, so it's been really, really good for me. Yeah. So maybe, maybe during your playing times or, or even now, I mean, who have you kind of admired in the business world or who's someone that you followed or you, you think is doing it the right way? You know, um, and of course, I, I first guy I think of is Ryan because Ryan made a bunch of money playing baseball, Ryan Howard. But you know now he's out here leading the charge with the analytics and the different entrepreneurs, especially in the esports e world. So he's out there trying to help players like myself understand how to get involved in the business world, how to get involved in front of um, decision makers, guys that can say, "Hey, 
we're going to put a million dollars, two million dollars, ten million dollars to a great project. Um, I, I appreciate that. I see how he's putting his money to use. There's guys that I play with like um, Jeremiah Trotter, right? And so he invested a bunch of his money in, in, in the Dominican Republic, right? And so he's building condos in DR. And so he built the first, the first tranche of condos. I think he built um, a thousand condos. And so now he's just renting them out, renting them out. And same thing, now he goes to another, another um, section, another neighborhood and continues to build. And so I've been around a lot of guys that um, have taken their wealth They've been smart about it. They're not going to use all their wealth in one, one particular sector, one particular investment. They've you know, diversified that, and they've been very, very successful. They've also have learned some lessons where they said, you know, I tried this project, and it, didn't, it did not work. Right. And we're not going to make that mistake again. Gotcha. And, and so um, we got about five minutes left, and then we'll get some, some Q&A. Um, today, you're, you're everywhere. <laughs> Try to. You got, you got the, the social media going, but you, I mean, you're on radio and TV and um, obviously investing. And then, you know, I want you to talk about your foundation and yeah. um, just how everything you're doing today. It's a lot. Yeah. So, so now it's all about, you know, like I said, I'm 39 years old. I, I retired when I was 31 years old. And so now the biggest part of my life is really raising my kids. So I have three kids, five, two and, and three weeks old. And so the biggest part of my life now is raising them, but to be able to raise them the way that I want to live and things like that, we have to obviously make money. And so um, I'm looking for different opportunities to invest in. Um, I, I still do TV and radio stuff. I work for Direct TV on Sundays, do radio stuff regionally in Philadelphia. I'm a um, contributor on First Things First from time to time on Fox Sports One. So I do all, do all of those things. All those things are, are important to me, certainly help to allow me to raise my family the way that I want to raise them. Um, my passion right now is, is helping underprivileged youth. Um, and so that, that same horse farm that I talked about, um, we, we ran it as a boarding farm for you know, 12 years. And now, you know, the last couple of years, the climate of the world, we need to help people. You have the ability to help people. And as you guys make money, you guys are gonna be millionaires. As you guys make money, never forget about giving back. Never forget about servicing those communities that you came from, servicing those people that don't have anybody else to represent them, to help them. And so a big thing that I wanted to do with my farmer, we kicked all the horses out. So all those people that were boarders, we had 30 of them. We kicked them all out. And now we're building an um, empowerment center for children. Um, what I found is that um, for the lucky kids that are smart, you know, like you guys, you guys will go off from high school, go to college, and do great things. There's another 50, 55% of kids that will never go to college, right? And unfortunately, in this world, when you don't go to college, which is everyone's dream, they, they're kicking a lot of these kids to the wayside, right? And so if you don't get straight A's, or you don't go to college, you can't do those things, you know, they're kicked to the wayside, wayside and now they're trying to figure out life. And so for us, we wanted to build a center that empowered, you know, those people that are in college, help you with some of your things that you're doing, but also those people that didn't make it to college. And so what we've done, we built a foundation, a 501c3, a charitable foundation, and we're going to teach them about horses, but we're also going to teach them about, you know, how to be an electrician, how to be a plumber, how to be, you know, all these different things, a mechanic, that you can use your hands and be profitable. The biggest thing that we had to teach a lot of our kids was the definition of success. So many of them thought that if you play football, you rap, you know, you do different things, you sell drugs, you can be successful that way. You make a million dollars, you're successful. What we've tried to explain to these kids is that if you make a million dollars today, right, and you spend a hundred, I mean, a million and one dollar, then you're broke. You're unsuccessful. But if you make fifty thousand dollars, you pay all your bills and you save five thousand dollars. To me, you're very successful. And we had to change the way that a lot of our kids viewed success and what they wanted for themselves. All they saw was the rich athletes, the rich, um, the rich rappers, those types of people. We need to show them people that came from right where you're sitting at that be, can be successful. And so one of the guys that we introduced him to is one of my good friends. He started a, a trash company with basically nothing. He had no trash trucks or anything. And so what he did was he, he worked there. He said, listen, instead of you paying me, allow me to use a trash truck at nighttime for free. And he said, okay. And so he would go out and he developed his own route. After, the, after getting 20 clients, he, he said, I need another truck. So over time, he got four, five, six trucks. Next thing you know, he had 20 trucks. He owned a fleet of trucks while he worked for this other company. 
Now this guy was one of my good friends. He makes 10 million bucks a year, started from trash. I mean, all he does is go around and pick up trash, but he continues to better himself, continues to better um, his vision as it continued to grow, and he was very successful. And so there's a lot of different ways to make money, and that's what we're trying to teach, teach these young kids. We also do resume building. We also do financial literacy. literacy. We do leadership um, training. We're doing all the things that can help build a well, more, much more well-rounded young, young person in today's climate. That's, that's awesome. So. That's awesome. Uh, so we're going to end on some, some quick hits. Sure, let's do then, it. And then take some Q&A. So favorite video game to play? <laughs> I grew up in a day and age where we didn't really have video games like that. And so I, I would have to say probably Madden from back in the day. I haven't yeah. played video games in a long time, though. Got it. Uh, favorite NFL player today? My favorite player today? I think the, I, you know, I, I, I tell you, I'm not just saying because we're here, but I think Saquon probably is my favorite just because he's so exciting, he's so humble, he seems like a great guy, um, but he's also responsible for carrying the franchise. He did that last year. We're hopefully, we're hoping, and, I, and I'm, I'm very confident that he has the ability to do it. I'm hoping that he's able to carry the, the franchise, the, the Giants, onto the future. They just have to find a way to replace some of the holes that they've, they've made in the offseason. Got it. Favorite uh, Penn State football player? Anyone that you uh, watched back in the day or? Babe, favorite. Um, so back in the day, and he, actually his parents are one of my neighbors, and I played against a guy. There was this freak of an athlete, and he was just nasty. It was a guy named LeVar Arrington, right? This, this guy, and, and it was crazy because and as a smaller guy, I'm 5'10-ish, and so <laughs> um, he's 6'4", 250, just all muscle, and every time we played him, as I watched him in college, leaping over their pile, beating people up, but every time we, he played for the Redskins, and every time we played him, I was responsible for blocking him, which is stupid, really. Um, <laughs> and so our coaches would be telling me, oh, we, all you have to do is do this and do that. And I would get in the game and like, none of those things that you said work. This guy is an absolute freak. So to me, he was the, probably the best. Gotcha. And we'll, we'll end on this. What do you got for uh, this year's Super Bowl coming up? And do not Already? Say, do, wow. not say, do not say New England. No, no, I would never say okay. New England. So, just checking, um, just checking. I think the right answer would be the Eagles, but I think, I mean, you got to right. think about teams like uh, the Saints. You got to think about the Rams, things like that. And just any, to me, anybody except for the, the, the Patriots would be good. I, I, just, <laughs> I think everybody hates them now at this point. Fair enough. All right, we'll uh, open up for some Q&A real quick. Sure. touched on two things, especially one, nurturing relationships, and two, planning for that next step. So one thing I want to know is after you completed your professional career in the NFL, what did you do right away to facilitate making those moves, making sure that those bridges weren't burned, yeah. and um, maintaining those relationships so that they didn't slowly fizzle out? Well, that, that's a really good question. You're right. Again, those relationships are going to make or break you in this world. That's, that's what I found out. And over time, you may have to start calling in some favors if things aren't working out. And so I think it's important to continue to nurture those relationships. So for me, at the end of my career, I wanted to get into broadcasting. Unfortunately, during my career, I hated talking to like the journalists. I hated it. I hated talking to them. I hated being around them. I just wanted them to understand, look at my play on the field and judge me by that. Don't judge me by my words. I'm not going to talk a good game. I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that I'm the best player by the play on my field. Now, as a journalist, now I'm in the media, you want people to talk to you, right? And so for me, it was a tough transition because a lot of the people that were in the media, they were, they were basically saying, well, you've never talked. How are you going to be a journalist? You've never, literally have never done an interview with me. You won't do an interview with me. And so for me, it was, it was tough. I had to get on air and, you know, you had to perfect the English language. You have to do better at making eye contact with the camera, things like that. So it was tough for me, but luckily I was able to be around some guys that had done it before um, that kind of showed me the way. Um, luckily, I was nice enough to the right people at different stations, so they gave me an opportunity to go talk about football. And now, over time, I've developed relationships. You talk about nurturing those relationships. So way back in the day, eight years ago, I, I did a fantasy show for CBS. And the guy called me. I had no clue what the heck I was doing. 
and he called me and said, you want to do the show? This is my first time on TV. Literally had no clue. Didn't know what camera to look at. Didn't know how to study every week for the show. And one of the guys on the show said, after the first show, he was like, listen, I can tell you have no clue. And I was like, I, I literally, I don't, know what, I don't know what to do. He said, I'm going to show you how to study. I'm going to show you how to watch the tape to present and be prepared for the show. I'm going to show you how to look at the cameras, different things like that. Those types of relationships have been important. Now, that same producer, after that year, that show got canceled, probably because of me. But um, show got canceled. That same producer came back to me this year because we remained friends. We would go out and golf. We would do different things together, hang out. And he gave me the job at DirecTV. Same guy. And he, obviously, he's, he watched my career as I progressed in the, in the broadcasting field. But that's why it's important um, to nurture those relationships because you never know when you know, that same guy that you met five years ago, woman that you met 10 years ago, could now help you potentially get a job in the future. And so for me, um, you know, at the end of my career, it was about transitioning to the next step and then finding those people that can make the difference in what I wanted to do. I had to figure that out first. What do you want to do? Do you want to be a bum and stay home all day long? Which was good for a long time. And I did that for a long time. But then I figured I would have to, have to work. And so then I went and found the people that I've crossed paths with um, over time. And they, they were certainly willing to help me at that point. That was crucial. That's a great question. Thank you. Cool. Got one more? All right. Pats or Gino. Now, people in Philly love the cheese stick, right? And so I myself, I don't even like cheese. But I do like, you know, it's kind of weird, right? But I, I, like, I like the steak part of it. So if, last time I went there, I went to Gino's. Or what about you? What's your favorite? Pats. Pats, why? And I want to see how your hands are. You ready? I have great hands. Some of the best hands. You see that? That's one-handed right there. <laughs> this is a really nice ball. What is this? This is yours? Yes. Nice. This is from Pats. No, it's not. not. <laughs> All right, let's do one more real quick. Go ahead. Do you guys feel that companies like Kevin Durant's 35 Ventures are changing the way that athletes view investing? Really good question. I think, you know, for years, you know, athletes are getting paid crazy money. Kevin, Kevin Durant is getting paid more money than I can even imagine. So I think athletes are now starting to try to figure out how can they put their money to use? How, they, how can they be bosses? instead of workers, right? And so they're, they're starting companies like Kevin Durant and Ryan getting involved with 76 Capital, and they're trying to figure out how to make their money work for them. And they're also coming together as groups and saying, all right, we got five guys that made LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry. We're going to build a corporation where now as athletes we can, can take some of the control. And I, I, think it's, I think it's great. It also shows you know, everyone, that you don't have to just be a, an athlete. You don't have to just play football. You don't have to just be a baseball player. You can do a lot of different things at the same exact time, and you can use the same resources that you use for sports to be successful in the business world. And this, it's, again, it's the same process, the hard work, dedication, discipline, and sacrifice. It's the same thing that makes you successful in sports that'll make you successful in the business world. And so they're just using those things that make them great basketball players or football players or baseball players and putting it into the business world. And now they're becoming businessmen. And it's been really, really good to see because a lot of people, this is, this is what happened. When I talk to these young kids in our program, all they can envision is what they see. So they see Kevin Durant making a bunch of money. They see the guy on the corner making a bunch of money. They see Jay-Z, Drake, whoever else making a bunch of money. That's all they can envision. But now when they see Jay-Z dabbling in other businesses, they see Kevin Durant doing other businesses, now they can start you know, expanding their mind to different areas. When they see me and my other players that I play with doing different things, they can start thinking different things and thinking much larger than the small scale things that they were thinking about before. And now the, mon the money starts to multiply. That's how you build a community. That's what some of these guys are doing. They're providing great examples for, for young people that prior to that, didn't know that there was something else uh, other than playing sports. Gotcha. Well, look, thank you very much, Penn State. Thank you thank for you having guys. us. Thank you.